we go. Good. Would you please stand with us? We're so glad you're here. We're happy that you're here to worship with us. Let's settle our hearts today on the Lord, see what he has to tell us today, and, uh, and just be thankful. He's good. He's good. So let's worship. your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage. Hold on. Be strong. Remember where our hell comes for us. Lord, you are. Singing moves and shouts. 
shakes the ground Your beck and brings the rain and drown Your glory spins the earth around And your whisper makes your fire fall down There's no revives the sick and lame. Your power wakes the dead again. And your love destroys the grip of sin. Sing it out. Oh, your love destroys the grip of sin. Oh, oh, oh. there's no other name. Like yours, Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other name like yours, Jesus. Like yours, Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other name like yours, Jesus. Like yours, Jesus. tongue confess the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess the
Jesus, like yours, Jesus. Amen, amen. All glory to his name. He's faithful and good. He's faithful. We find in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, and it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, 
if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the same form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being, even, being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Lord, for that truth that we have the hope in the mightiest name of all that we can find rest in you, that we can find hope in you. May your name be exalted in this place as we seek your face. Would you speak to our hearts as we open up to what you have to say to us today, that we would learn that truth deeply, that there is no other name that could save us, that can give us hope, that can redeem us, that can give us a future and an eternity with you, but Jesus. May that be our focus today in our heart. You be exalted, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen and good morning. Good morning. There we go. Let's try that one more time, one more time. Oh, I love the energy. I love the energy. Let's try it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you that may be new or visiting, my name is Jonathan Gomez, and I have the privilege of serving here as a campus pastor. And we here at Calvary Chapel, Pembroke Pines, are a part of what God is doing in South Florida through Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. We're a regional campus, and what that means is that we're one church in many different locations, and we go through the Word of God together, and we serve together, and it's always a blessing to know that we not only are serving here, but around South Florida, we're all going through the word of God together. And so I invite you now, if you need a Bible, raise your hands. We'll get one to you. But we're studying through the book of Philippians. And so we'll start today in Philippians chapter 2. So go ahead and get that ready. But before we go there, I would love to tell you a little bit about what's happening here. First, I wanted to say, and I don't know if any of you have been a part of it, but in the, in the west coast of Florida right now, people aren't as fortunate as this. We sit here today and we have air conditioning and, and dry seats. Uh, but today one of our brothers here who had the opportunity to go to the west coast showed me pictures of what it's like to see refrigerators floating across living rooms as the flooding was so serious that it was up to their necks. And it's crazy to think that while we were here blessed, there's other people that aren't as fortunate. And so your generosity has blessed the West Coast as well. And so if you're part of that and have contributed to, uh, contributed to what God is doing through that, it's an opportunity for us to shine and to shine the light of Jesus into that community. And so I'm grateful for that and for this church and for what we do in those regards. Also, just locally, some of the things that are happening currently, uh, I don't know if you know this, but we are going to celebrate our one-year anniversary next week. One year. I know. I look, I look a one year older, just, just in case, right? It's been one whole year, uh, and we are going to celebrate. And so here's what I want to let you know. This is an opportunity for us to invite others, an opportunity to celebrate what God has done here. And not just here, not just being in a space or location, but what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. God is at work, and we're trying to join that work, right? And so I'm, I invite you next week, come 
from 11 to 12.30 after service. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have the access to the foyer area out in the front, and we're going to have games and food and things to celebrate what God has done, to have an opportunity to fellowship, but also to be a light into our city. So I invite you to tell someone, invite someone, and be a part of that. Finally, I wanted to tell you that this afternoon there's the fix conference that is happening for lauderdale camp uh the, at the fort lauderdale campus it's a it's a campus uh it's a campus it's an event for recovery and it's an event about what god is doing also around mental health and other areas and so we want to invite you to that if that's something that pertains to you mental health is such a big topic in our community right now as recently i received a notice from a school from the school board uh, about another child that took his own life, a young person. And it's a real topic. And, and there's many people that are struggling, but there's a lot of stigma around it. And so we want to remove that. We want to be the church that addresses the culture with the word of God. And so if that's you or you know someone that would be benefit from that or that could help or that that event would, would bless, please come. Enjoy, share, and let's start a conversation about what God wants to do in that area of our lives. Finally, and with great joy, I have someone here that I would love to introduce you, my sister Sandra Alegre, please. For those of you that don't know, uh, my sister Sandra and her husband, Pastor Juan Alegre, are in Cajabamba, Peru. Uh, I had the opportunity, I've been to Peru three times now on mission trips over there, and I can attest that God is doing an amazing thing in Peru. And so we just wanted to take an opportunity and, and say welcome. I know this is home to you, right? You used to live in Weston right up the road, <laughs> which is ironic. Um, but first and foremost, we're, I'm excited and blessed Thank to have you, you here. You. Uh, and second of all, please tell us a little bit of, of that calling over there and what God's doing in Cajabamba. Well, a lot of uh, you know that my heavy accent, I don't know if it's going to be, you know, that <laughs> questionable, but I hope you understand my heavy accent. But, yeah, we've been in Cajabamba for almost nine years and a half. And we have been planting a church there, and we thought that maybe it will be a planting church like a regular church like you are here. But the Lord guide us to another, another thing, guide us to uh, uh, care for children, abuse children, uh, uh, abuse, sexually abuse, physical abuse, and abandon orphans. So little by little, the, the Lord was working in our hearts. And uh, seven years ago, God uh, gave us donate us a piece of land and that piece of land was there for seven years we didn't know what to do because it was for an orphanage but we didn't have the money all of the sun God provided money from a lady from nowhere uh, gave us the money to build one house uh, but at that house you know God has another plans because we can handle one house but that now the Lord told us and is, we are building 12 homes how we don't know the Lord knows because he is the one who is in front of us. He told us that. And just to make you a quick story, it's like before we didn't have a uh, favor with the, with the authorities because they accuse us that we are stealing the kids, that we are taking the organs, and we are going to ship it to the United States. That's when we arrived. And you were there. You were there when, when the people with machetes and everything, they, they wanted to take us out of Cajabamba, and we stayed. And then, you know, a lot of things happened like that, but we decided to stay because the Lord told us to stay there. We didn't know how, why, for, whatever, but we decided to stay. So now the judges that, who were against us, now they are asking us. They, I was uh, in shock two days ago because we have like four, five, six kids right now under our shelter in different homes of the, shir- of the church. And um, because we were coming here, uh, the Lord told us to come here and tell the story you know, this story to everybody who can hear, who want to hear. And the judge called me and said, Sandra, what should I do? I need to take this girl to the abuser, back to the abuser. And I said, you are asking me, what should I do? I mean, you are the judge. And he said, well, Sandra, I'm sorry. I have until 1130 to make the official to send her back. And I said, please, please don't do it. They, they are great. They change. I mean, their love cries, but please. And he said to me, I'm sorry, if you don't have a place for her, and we are nobody there. We don't have a license yet, nothing. We are just the, the church who helps. 
So we, I start sending messages to everybody to, to, to pray for this girl. Some of you got that message, you know, when you were praying. So all of the sun, you know, um, 11.30. So we were with my daughter, but the Lord told us some, something. I am going to put my heart in the people's heart. I, I want the orphans to have a home. I want the brokenhearted, you know, to, um, to raise the trauma, everything. I, I want new. I, I want them to be new in Christ. So we were praying. I said, we cannot ask anybody from the church because that will be us. So we started praying, and my daughter had a dream saying that uh, one of her friends was supposed to get this girl. And, you know, in the other hand, I have my phone. Somebody's texting me saying, Sandra, Sandra, please call me because I don't have minutes for my, uh, to make a phone call. I, she, she's poor, you know. And I said, oh, my God, maybe she needs food. Maybe she needs that. She can wait. And then my daughter says, okay, mommy, what should we do? And says, but the Lord told us don't ask anybody. So we were in this, like, should we ask? Should we, you know, go for what should we do? And then finally I said, you know what, let me call, let me call this lady first. So I called this lady who was trying to get to reach me, and she said, Sandra, this morning the Lord spoke to my husband to help each other in the church. And when I read your message, I think we are the ones that we, we need to take care of this girl. And I start crying because this lady doesn't have anything, doesn't have a job, the husband, and they have the heart, and they said, what about the food? And he said, somebody will provide the food for them Be because we are here. I said, okay, maybe the church will handle it too. And then all of a sudden, I have another phone call from another lady who told me, Sandra, my husband, even though he's not a Christian yet, he told me that he's going to provide the food for, this lady, for these girls for the whole entire time that they are in this house. And the other, the other family comes and says, I'm going to bring uh, clothes and everything for them. So the entire church is involved. And not only with this girl. We have five families now that they are taking care of these girls until the refuge of hope is, is done. We are in the middle of um, two buildings. And, you know, we are praying for provision. So, you know, here we are. I'm asking you for you to pray to pray for these girls, for this heart, and the revival that is in the hearts of the people of Cajabamba. There is a revival. There is, they are building not only the hearts, but they are building the, the, the real building. So we don't know what the Lord is doing, but we know that he is doing it. Amen, amen. <laughs> Thank you, my sister. And I love your passion. I love your passion for what God is doing, and, and you are a blessing. And I know the people of Cajabamba are also blessed by what God is doing there. Mi casa, tu casa. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I can attest to the Peruvian hospitality. They are really a huge blessing to us. Um, so after service today, there will be a table out in the front. If you want to find out more about what's happening in Peru and, and what God is doing there, please stop by and visit our sister Sandra. I'm sure she'll be excited to talk to you. Um, and now without further ado, let's pray and invite the Lord into this time. Father, we are grateful for your spirit, that today we sit before your word and that you want to speak to us, that we have direct connection to you, Lord. And you said that you would lead us into all truth, and so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and teach us now. And God, to change our hearts and our minds, to change the way we see things to reveal to us your son. But God, that it would have a tangible impact in the way we live, in the way we love one another, in the way we're united, God. Lord, because that was your greatest desire when you, before you left us. You prayed for unity, Lord. And so I pray for supernatural unity, God. Not a unity that the world can provide, but a unity that comes as we all follow your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray for that grace now in Jesus' name. Amen. I think, therefore, I am. That's what Descartes said, a French philosopher. And there is some truth to that, right? It's like the you are what you eat. 
And if we went around here and we talked about how we eat and what we think is healthy, it would be hilarious to hear the stories. Whether it's the keto diet or the Atkins diet or everybody has a way they think about what's healthy and what's not. And the way you think impacts how you eat. The way you think about yourself also impacts the way you live. How you perceive yourself in the hierarchy of this world or see yourself at work or see yourself in your family impacts the way you treat others, impacts the way you engage with the community around you. And I always think about some of the, the crazy things that, that happens to me of when you believe someone. Oh, I, th I thought he was going to do this, and they didn't come through. Or I thought they were going to be my friend, and they were going to hold out, and they, they were going to stick by me, but now they kind of turned their back on me. And so you base your things on what you believe. You base your lives on the way you think. And today, we're blessed because God is going to give us an insight into the mind of Christ and how Jesus thought about himself and about others, and how God sees him. Now, for those of you that may be joining us or, or haven't caught up, we're in Philippians chapter 2, and we were reviewing just some of the, the truths about this and that you may or may have not thought of, but Paul is in prison. He's chained. It's a lonely place in prison. And out of all these things, as he's chained, he talks about joy. And that even though he's in these unbelievable circumstances, chained to a guard 24-7, he has faith. He has faith that God will deliver him. He has faith that God is working in the lives of, of his people. And he's writing this letter to the church. And he says in Philippians 1.27 about whatever happens around us and to us, that we're called to a different life. That we are not the same as the people around us. That when they go through trials and tribulations, that they, they just focus on that. But that there's a greater joy that is not based on our circumstances. And we want to live this kind of life. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so join me in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. I'll read it for you. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, of any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And here's my first point. Think of others first. Think of others first. Where, where he's saying this, now we read those verses, he's talking there about encouragement, if there's encouragement, if there's comfort, if there's tenderness. But I want you to understand that in the original language, it's not an if, but it's more of a because. Because we are loved, because of what Christ has done, because of the tender mercy and compassion that Christ has shown us, well then... Live this way. And order is important. First, before God asks us for anything else, he comes and dies for us and he gives us an example. The gospel is God's unconditional love for us, and the great exchange. It's our motivation for how we live life. And we never do anything. As we go through this text and talks about different things that we should be doing. We never do anything to earn God's love, to earn God's acceptance. But because we are loved, because we are accepted, there's nothing that we can, do, can fail to do to make that love stop, which is the greatest promise of the gospel. And now, because of who we are in Christ, then make Paul happy, and I would say make me happy as well, by pursuing unity, pursuing unity. It says being like-minded, same love, one in spirit, one of mind. Now, unity 
is not uniformity, right? And we've talked about that some. The idea that, well, now we should all dress the same. We all wear the uniform when you come to church. We all have white shirts, and we wear a jacket, and we wear the same colors. I love the fact that as I look around this room, we have people from so many different places, so many different backgrounds. And the idea is not that now we're all the same. It means that we're all here on the same goal, on the same objective, on the same trajectory. And that is becoming more like Jesus. Anybody here want to be more like Jesus? And that's the guy that unites us. At the end of the day, all of our objective, all of our energy, all of our hope is in the one man, Jesus Christ. And that's what brings us together. And when we look at the text, he's talking about this being like-minded of the same love, of the same spirit. And that, I, that word for, for mind at the end is actually different than the first one. It's actually talking about this goal. You see, the gospel is missional. It's not just I, Jesus died for me and now that's it. But that Jesus died for me for a purpose. Ephesians says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That means you have a purpose assigned to you. That God has uniquely created you for that. And even though you have been created for a purpose, it is like a team. Everybody has their own role. Everybody has their own place. But the victory comes to everyone. And so when you're at work, not everybody has the same talents and gifts, right? And you see, there may be 10 people, and I, I could tell you, so I currently work in accounting. Yes, accounting is boring. But I, it's funny to see when you have 10 different people that each one of them has different gifts and different abilities and different talents. And so my job is not to make them all the same. My job is to find their niche and how to best help them use their abilities for the success of the company. Now follow that into the church. You have unique abilities. And that does not mean that now we're all going to do the same thing. We're all not going to do hospitality the same. We're all not going to do worship the same. I wish I could sing like my sister Eileen. I can't. Like, we can't do it, right? But God still has a unique place for you. And in that, we're all together on this mission. There's a unity, a beautiful unity that we can all experience. Now, the question always for me is, why don't we experience it then? Well, there's this other caveat. It's we're sinners, right? We're all sinners, and we all, have, we all think about ourselves a little bit more, which brings us to the next part, which is pursuing humility. You see, without humility, there can be no unity. We need to have the humility built in, and God has to refine us in that, in order to pursue and truly be united. Otherwise, it becomes something superficial. Where we say we're together, but we're all on our own agenda and our own uh, endeavor. And that's what he's talking about. He says here, do nothing. Not some things. Not most things. Completely. It means no exceptions. Do nothing out of selfish and build ambition. That means for your benefit. Have you ever had that coworker? That they want to help you, but just because it'll make them look good. Right? Or you, you, you do something for someone else. Oh, yeah, hey, I just wanted to give you this washer and dryer. Oh, that's great because I was about to throw it away and now you get to pick it up. <laughs> right? It's this sort of thing. Right? It's, yeah, yeah, I'm helping you. It seems like there's a positive effect for you, but really it's, it's just convenient for me. And that's how the world operates. The world operates out of the, how does this benefit me? I remember, and I was, I was saying it this morning at the pre-service meeting. I was in New York City, and you know New York City. Everybody's rushing down the street, and you don't even know why you're running. You're like, why am I running? And so we come up to this McDonald's, and I'm in the city, and I decide that I'm going to open the door for the person behind me. So I opened the door, and I just blinked, and 30 people walked in. And so now I'm in the back of, 
of this McDonald's. And I'm like, now I'm last in line. This is amazing, right? And so I'm upset. I'm upset because I'm thinking to myself, like, how? Why did I help them? It didn't benefit me. You see, that, that's what, what happens when we, we look at humility. The problem with humility is that we think if I'm humble, then people will step all over me. If I put myself down, then people are just going to take advantage of me. And people are going to abuse me or people are going to do that, uh, are going to take, yeah, take advantage of me. And that's the hard part. But that's not the example we see in Jesus. That even though he was trampled, and, and one of the things that always gets me about Jesus and dying for our sins, more so than even the crucifixion, is the fact that he handed himself over to sinful men and an unfair trial. Think about it. It was completely unfair. And yet he did it. He let himself be trampled. He let himself be put down. Why? Because he loved you. Because he loved me. And so when we look at selfish ambition, it's always what we get out of it. But there's also this word for conceit. I like the way the Spanish actually says it. It says vana gloria, vain glory. The idea that it's you're promoting yourself. It's like you're, you're kind of boosting yourself up even though there's nothing really to boost yourself up about. You know, we call them hype men, right? The guy that's just screaming in the background, yeah, yeah, right, of the, of the rap concert. He's not doing anything, but he's hyping up the crowd, right? Why? Is there anything to be hyped about? No, but it just sounds good, right? And so the guy's, the guy's having a great time, and, and that's, that's what this is talking about, that you can promote yourself, that you can, you can talk yourself up, and that you could kind of puff yourself up in a way, but there's no substance to what you're being boosted up about. And, and here's the point, though. It's the way that you combat the selfish ambition and the empty conceit is to value others. It's not about asking yourself or neglecting yourself or hating yourself, right? We live in this world like self-esteem is bad. Oh, no, you shouldn't have low self-esteem. You should love yourself and you know, and I always tell people, I could tell you my house is worth a million dollars to me. Does it make it worth a million dollars? No. I could tell myself that I'm the most valuable person in the world. Does it make me valuable? No. The market justifies that. What someone is willing to pay for it, my life is worth something because Jesus gave it all. And so my value does not reside even in my own self-perception. It is based on Jesus Christ and what he was willing to do for me. And that is the most powerful thing that gives us value. However, humility can sometimes be misinterpreted for just, oh, no, I'm the worst. Oh, I'm, the, you know, you're kind of like an Eeyore looking guy. Like, uh, you know, you carry your head down. And it's not, it's not that. Actually, I like what C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. He said, do not imagine that if you met a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be sort of a greasy, swarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you would think about him is that he seemed cheerful, an intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. You see, humility is not about thinking about yourself less. It's about thinking of others more. That means that you're genuinely interested in the well-being and the, and the success of others. That you're looking at the question of how can I help them? How will it benefit them? And that's kind of antithetical to our culture, isn't it? I mean, most people are looking to the way that we think about ourselves, right? You think about me first. You think about how I can get promoted, how I can be successful, how I can have more. Now imagine a world, for a second, where everybody truly looked out for the good of others. Where everybody on the road let you pass in front of them. 
Oh, yes, please, please, come in, come in, right? You know, the kind soul that does that. Or that people don't curse you out at the gas station during the hurricanes. Because that was a topic just a little couple weeks ago. There's a hurricane. No, I was here in line first, and the lines at the gas station are crazy, and everybody's on edge, buying up all the toilet paper, all the food. There's no food in the shelves because everybody's in crisis mode. And as soon as you see a crisis is where you see how people respond. People all of a sudden don't care about their neighbor or about the person at the line. No, it's self-preservation. It's how is this going to work for me? Imagine a world where people didn't let the dogs relieve themselves on your lawn. Right? There, there, is, there is this thing like, oh, why would you do that? No, you think about others. And you don't think about your convenience. You think about, about how you can benefit people. It's, it's hard to imagine a world like that. Because we ourselves aren't like that. We don't think like that of others. But I'll also preface this, that it's supposed to be different within the, these four walls, within the church, within our lives, within this community of faith. Just the idea of Jesus saying, hey, if someone asks you to walk a mile with them, walk with them too. The idea was that a Roman soldier could ask any citizen to carry the, their, their luggage or their equipment for a mile with them. And we say, hey, you know what? Even though it only benefits them for one, go with them the extra mile. How do we do that? Well, we're going to find out a little bit more right now. So let's read verse 5. In your relationship to one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And here's my second point. Think of yourself as a servant. See, it's one thing to think of others first and to consider them worthy to be served. Uh, well, it's one thing to think of others first, but another to place yourself in a place of service to others. Completely different, right? Because, like I said, I, I can be nice to you. I can be kind to you. I can be hospitable to you. But then ask me to do something inconvenient. All of a sudden it's like, ah, you know, I know you're arriving from the airport at 1 a.m., but that's not, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Why? Because we think of ourselves first. Now, this section here is actually an old hymn, an old song, an old poem about being humble. But the reality is that telling yourself, be humble, Jonathan, be humble, Jonathan, be humble, Jonathan, that doesn't really get you far. Because then even if you become humble, then you're prideful about being so humble. Because you did it through your own human effort, right? Oh, I'm just the most humble person. You know, thank you, right? That's hard. It's hard to brag about your humility. But it's because you're giving yourself credit. We do not achieve humility through human effort. We achieve humility through a right view of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what 2 Corinthians says. That we are being transformed as we look at Jesus. That there's something that happens when we see the example of Christ, of what he did for us, that changes us from the inside out. Because we're not breaking ground or doing something amazing. We're just doing what was already done for us. And that allows us to take the focus off of ourselves and put it on Jesus Christ. And there's something very powerful here about the very, he says here that he had the very nature of God. That he was the very substance of God, but did not hold equality with God. So this throws out any idea that Jesus was just a good person. Jesus was just a good teacher. Jesus was just, no. Jesus had the very nature of God, and yet he humbled himself. I was trying to figure out how I could express this maybe in an in a interesting way. Have you guys ever been to dinner and they have these like fancy glasses out there, even though I don't know, I'm not going to use it. Okay. 
they have it there and they're like, oh, would you like some water? Oh, this is for the water. Great. You know, so they pour some water off for you. And you're sitting there in this bougie restaurant because they don't do this at McDonald's. <laughs> right? And they, and they serve you this glass of water. And you're sitting there and you, and you realize at this point, hey, this bill's probably going to be expensive. Because nobody serves me water like that, right? Imagine for a second that I did this. And I took my dog bowl and I poured out my dog bowl, my, my water into the dog bowl. The water didn't change. The na- Jesus, when he emptied himself into human form, his divinity was not lost. The water still remained, the water, so to speak. But now let me tell you, if I were to come here and not, right? Oh, right away, is he going to do it? Is he, is, is he? Right? You would think twice about it, right? You're like, Jonathan, don't do that. That's disgusting, Jonathan. That's the point. Jesus was sitting in glory in eternity with the Father. And then he said, I'm going to come into my own creation. I'm going to come and be born a man. But listen, he just wasn't born a man. Because he could have been a king and still lowered himself by being a man. He came and he says he took the form of a servant. He lowered himself to the place of a servant. So much so that he stripped himself pretty much naked and washed our feet in the disciples. As a representation of his servanthood to us. And not only did he come here as a servant, but he was obedient even to death. He died for us. But if, so he could have died for us and he could have died anyway, but he didn't die anyway. He died on a cross like a criminal, like a nobody. You understand? Jesus was sitting in glory and yet he chose to empty himself out. And become nothing for you and for me. For you and for me. And this is where we see humility. Not in, our, not in just the, the fact that Jesus came and died for our sins. And, and here's the problem. When, when I came and was about to drink the bowl, you're like, oh, Jonathan, please don't do this, right? Do we ever think like that about Jesus? Does it ever affect us? Why would you do that, Lord? Why would you die like that for me? Why would you give your life? Why would you be, submit yourself in the hands of, of humans, of sinners for me? And not just die, but be tortured for hours. Hours. The most painful death, the most excruciating death for you and for me. That's what humbles us. That's what humbles us when we look at Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And it's only there that we find humility. No other place. Jesus got his hands dirty for us. He didn't just say, let it be done. But he came and he, he stood with us. And what he, one of the things that always gets me is well, there was a lot of religious rites at that time, right? There was a lot. Don't touch lepers. Don't touch a woman while she is, you know, going through her monthly cycle. Don't, 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 don't. And yet Jesus touched all those people. He wasn't afraid of getting his hands dirty. He served them. He healed them. He loved them. He gave himself for them. And he didn't just say it. Because he could have just said it. He could have come here with all his knowledge, all his wisdom, all his miracles. And he could have said, be done. No, he touched people. Because he wanted to show people what it is. That it wasn't about being convenient for him. It was about his, his humility. Let's keep reading in verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And here's a third point. Think of your future reward. Think of your future reward. Jesus lowered himself as low as I think anyone could go. And what God does is that he exalts him higher than anyone else could go. Isn't that amazing? That, that God would, in his wisdom, right? When, uh, it's the, the word says that the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of God. That, that Jesus defeated death and sin and brought heaven for you and for me by dying. If you were going to win a war, dying is probably not the way to win the war, right? But that's how God, Jesus does it. And in that, in that weakness, now God exalts him above every name, above every king. And one day, every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. Every person will say, Jesus is Lord. And that's what God does. You see, because God resists the proud. I don't know if you know this. The, the, the more prideful you are, the farther that fall is when we realize how not good we are. The higher you... <laughs> I, I, I used to have a, a boss, and he would tell me, he's like, Jonathan... I've been around this business for a long time. I was in property management at the time. I've been around this business for a long time. And I will tell you that the people that want to climb the ladder, that are looking for that next rung, those are the people that sometimes they go so far out on a limb that they find themselves with no footing and fall off the tree. It's like, if you want to, and, and he, that's what, this was his advice, if you want to grow, do the right thing, work hard, and it will come by itself. That's, that was his advice to me. But even the world knows this. That's, that's kind of what impressed me, right? That even, even in the world it's true. That the more success you look for, now you're up here, you're making money, you're doing all this stuff, you're sustaining this lifestyle. When it's cut out from under you, what happens? You say all hell breaks loose. Because now I can't afford anything I got. Right? And it's, and it's this idea that pride actually is antithetical to the Christian life. Because in humility, God lifts us up. It says, humble yourselves before the hand of God. And in due time, he will lift you up. And so sometimes that's the hardest thing. Because humility means obeying. God, you know more than me. So therefore... I know that I don't necessarily understand why you tell me to give money. Or I don't understand why you tell me not to sleep with my girlfriend. I don't understand why I have to do this or I can't curse or I can't go out. I don't get it. And there's a point where we humble ourselves and say, I know I don't understand, but you do. And I'm going to humble myself under you. And you know what, what I can tell you from experience? I have never followed what the word says and ended up worse than I didn't, than if I didn't. It's always been better. Because God's word is true. God's word is wisdom. God's word is life. And when we pursue humility and say, God, you know more than me, all of a sudden God starts doing things in our lives. And the less we focus on ourselves, all of a sudden God gives us opportunities to serve him in different capacities and he raises us up and that's why it's always important that no matter where you are no matter at what point in your in your walk you are that you stay very conscious of that because you can start off humble and end up prideful right you can start off with a good thing oh this is a god thing this is god bless me with my car god bless me with my job god bless me with all these things and all of a sudden, we, we forget, just like the Israelites, we just read about it, right? We're going to have, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of stuff, Israelites, and you're going to have, you know, trees and vineyards you didn't plant and houses you didn't build and all this stuff. Don't forget, 
Don't forget where it came from. And pride is counterintuitive to the humility of Christ. And so when God blesses us, when God has prospered us, don't forget where it came from. Don't forget who did it for you. But God wants to lift you up. Because God has no, <laughs> he has no problem with that. Why? Because you don't put a light under a basket. You don't put a city hidden out. You put it on the hill. Why? So that we can lift our praise to Jesus. So that when we do well, God is glorified. Hey, I can't take any credit for what has happened to me. I was telling my wife recently, it's like, you know, honey, like God has been so faithful. And we can't take any credit for what God has done. I recently... I'm an Apple guy. Remember, guys, we talk about this all every week. I'm an Apple guy, which means that I have iCloud. And recently, I loaded all these pictures. I loaded 35,000 pictures <laughs> into iCloud, which is crazy because it's literally from the moments when I first met Olivia. So the last 13 years of my life have been made chronologically available to me. And so I can, I, I found a good picture of us, Pastor Doug, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, but it's, it's really amazing to see it because now I was like, hey, honey, do you remember this trip? Hey, honey, do you remember when we did this and we did that? And, and I, was, I just realized how much I'd forgotten about all the amazing things that God has done. I also remembered how much skinnier I was. And it, it, was, it was pretty sad. And I said, Lord, you know, you know all these things, Lord. But, it's, but it's, it's beautiful to remember. And so maybe you're at a place where God is like, hey, 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 humble yourself. Trust me. Follow me. And in due time, I will lift you up. But it's also possible that right now you're lifted up. And God is like, hey, remember me. Humble yourself or I might have to bring you down. Right? Because God shares his glory with no one. That's something that's clear. God shares his no glory with no man. And so we can either give, give credit to him now or we'll give credit to him on the final day when every knee will bow and confess. I'm going to invite our worship team now to come. And I would love to pray for us. Father, I just want to thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your humility. Thank you that you laid your life down for us. God, if we have grown cold to the truth of what you did for us, Father, forgive us, Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord, that we are forgetful people. But Lord, today, we just want to renew that. If we've grown prideful, Lord, if we've forgotten about you, if we've forgotten all the blessings, Lord, that you've poured out on us, Lord. Forgive us, God. But God, if, if we're in a place where we need you, Lord, where we already feel defeated, God, we humble ourselves under your sovereignty and under your mighty hand. And we understand that you're at work in all these things, God. And we pray that you would strengthen us, lift us up. But Lord, I pray that even as we study these words, God, we want to think like you think. We want to have your mind. We want to have your heart. We want to have your, the way you live, God. We want to follow your example. So help us to do that, God. We can't, we can't desire that enough or change enough. We can't, we can't dis discipline ourselves enough to attain it, God. The only way we can do it is through your spirit. So change us, Father, from the inside out. And glorify your name and your son, Lord. We believe in him. And God, even now I pray that if there's anyone here that has to step into that relationship with you, 
that they hear all these words and I just pray right now that you'd be at work, Lord, and that you prepare their hearts, God. We ask in Jesus' name. And before I say amen, I just want to give us an opportunity to respond to that. Jesus died for you. He loves you. And he didn't just die for you. He, he humbled himself for you. It's a parable of the, of the treasure in the field. That the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. And that a man sells everything he has to buy the field. And great is the joy when he gets to that field. And sometimes we can interpret that as us giving up everything for Jesus. But the reality is that Jesus gave it all up for you. You're the one he valued. You're the one worth a million dollars to him. A billion dollars, a zillion dollars. You were worth the treasure of heaven, Jesus Christ himself. And what he asks is, would you humble yourself? Would you give me your life? See what I can do with it. Would you give me your heart? See what I can do with it. Would you give me your pain? See what I could do with it. I want to be your savior. I want to be your friend. I want to be your healer. I want to change you. Because I love you. And so what we do here to start that relationship, we want to invite you just to stand in your seat. And we're going to say a prayer, and you're just going to repeat after me. And the idea is just this. We ask the Lord, God, come into my life. I give you my heart. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me to forgive my sins. Wash me clean. I am yours. And we believe... And the Bible says that when we do that in our hearts and we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that we will be saved. So I just want to invite you right now. We're going to sing a song. And if that's you, I ask that you stand up in your seat. And we'll pray that together. And we'll start a relationship with Jesus today. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the turns his face away has wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory and now we abide as children of light to Chains his 
escape by Jesus' strength. And now we abide as children of light to love as Christ has loved his bride. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your humility. God, we pray that, that we would behold you, not just today, Lord, but every day. That God, as we leave here, yes, we leave this moment in the study, but God, that, that you would truly pervade our minds with this truth, that you gave it all for us. And Lord, I pray that you would birth in us a sense to serve one another, to love one another, to do this in community with one another. God, and that as, as we grow in unity, as we grow in humility, God, that the world would see you and lift your name on high. God, one day every tongue will have to confess that you are Lord, but God, I I pray that we would confess that you are Lord now willingly out of love for you and for what you've done for us. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. You may stand. Guys, we are blessed and excited, and I am humbled by the idea that we've been here one year. So I'm excited to celebrate with you next week. Um, hope to see you there. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next week. Yep. Let's sing one more time. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. And our debt is paid, once dead, now saved, as heirs and saints, no longer slaves, from guilt to black, our chains through Christ, now we children of light. Thank you all for coming today. We hope that you have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week. God bless.